Oh, AC. You know, I've already, I've already shed a few tears today. They're tears of joy, but just thinking about, I, and I, we're going to celebrate this group later, but thinking about all the incredible fourth semester students that are in this room right now in their last chapel and just seeing so many leading worship up here and just what a, what a great moment. And that was an okay clap, but I think the four semesters deserve more honor than that. Let's honor their leadership, their faithfulness, the anointing that's on their life. We honor you guys. I mean, every class is incredible. You're, you're all incredible. That's, that's a great crew, everybody. I mean, I think you guys, can, you, you are going to launch churches and ministries and the dreams that are in your heart now don't come anywhere close to what God wants to do in your lives. And so we're gonna honor you later on, but just love you guys so much. And how about Nathan preaching up here this morning? My goodness. I don't know where he went, but oh yeah, yeah, right there, obviously, obviously. Bro, I would, hey, I would kill for that voice. That voice is the anointing, anointing. I got this country Alabama voice, but anyway, uh, just proud, so proud of you and just excited. Uh, to be here in this moment, honestly, just, just blown away. And uh, we're, we are going to just have a commissioning moment later on. And, of course, we have just one of our best friends on the planet here today who's going to bring an, imp- an incredible message. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, we do have a couple of our impact donors, who, people who are investing in the college. The Brashers are here today. I want to honor them. They're right over here. We honor you. Thank you. And I'm going to make y'all do a workout today because we also got our chancellor in the house. Pastor Chris is here. It's, it's incredible. Whoa, what a great moment. What a great moment. And uh, just, wow, sense God's presence here today in such a powerful way. It's been a great week. I did want to celebrate with you guys. You know, we had, of course, the impact dinner on, we're really, honestly, I want to go back actually to last Friday with the legacy dinner, which so many of, our, of you guys served at and made possible in the, the all staff Christmas party. I mean, we got a long list of things that have happened, honestly, in the last week. But of course, this week we had our impact dinner and then all day yesterday, our conference. And hey, y'all look at me. I am so proud of the way you led. I mean, the a countless number of comments. Of course, the content was great. Of course, the environment yesterday, I mean, leaders were here and they were, they were encouraged and strengthened. But honestly, the biggest comments we all got were about how you guys were serving, how, you, how you, the smile on your face, your desire to, to help people find if they had a question or to figure out their next step. And you just represented so well Highlands College, but even more importantly, Jesus yesterday. And so I know this is, maybe feels kind of weird, but I want to celebrate today. Give yourselves like a clap right now of just, hey, acknowledging it's just day. Hey, it's just different at Highlands College, and that difference is, is all of you guys. But I want to report, we are, we are going to celebrate uh, this. Uh, this is incredible. By far, by far the biggest year we've ever had. And Kay and your team just honor you guys for, for leading in the way so well. We had 1,458 in-person, uh, in, in-person uh, registrants who were here yesterday, which is uh, just awesome. Then our virtual registration was 12,650 for a total of 14,108 people that were strengthened in leadership yesterday. All 50 states, and check this out, 33 countries around the world. One more time. Come on, that's amazing. It's amazing. Let that never be normal. Like that's just, that's not normal in any way. And so it's incredible. And of course that event and and so much more around Highlands, honestly, the only heaven really reveal has been impacted by our speaker today. And I was thinking about Dr. Maxwell. There are so many titles that he has and could carry. Of course, he's a doctor. That's a really big deal. Um, he's he's a, a, a leadership guru. He's an author. He's an award winner. There's countless titles he could carry. I think it speaks everything about who he is, that the title he carries and how we know him as is as friend. And that friend title represents a, a person, a man who is a servant, who's a leader in every way, but has chosen to be a servant as Jesus modeled and to wash feet and to serve others and to add value. And the message he's going to bring today of course, last night was awesome at church on leadership, and he talks about how he has this leadership anointing, which is very clear, but there's also clearly 
the evangelistic, the evangelism anointing on his life. And the message he's going to bring today is right there in that anointing. And I'm so excited because I believe a transfer is going to happen off of his life onto your life. And, and there's so many different things. You've heard Pastor Chris talk about this. His ministry, Equip, which we're partnered with, is reaching literally now across over a million souls who've, who've been saved. And listen, that that's just compounding. And so now we're going to see, I believe all of my heart, Equip may be the largest, will reach the largest number of souls for Jesus Christ in history as it just continues to multiply. And of course, that's awesome. Um, but let me tell you what's more incredible and what I really want you to catch today is the personal evangelism that's on his life. In fact, just in the pre-service, I saw a list of people that right now he is personally leading to Jesus, sometimes over 200 a year off a stage that he is leading to Jesus because that's the big deal. And so we're believing today at leadership and Pastor Chris that as he speaks, again, there's gonna be a spiritual, just, just an anointing that's gonna come from him onto you. So what I need you to do, of course, is take notes. Of course, lean in, but I want you, HC, every one of you to open your heart in a special way today and receive from Jesus. Can you guys welcome our friend, Dr. John C. Maxwell to the HC stage. Thank you very, very much. Please be seated. I, uh, I would come all the way to Birmingham just to go to chapel. This service is so special. The, the way that God works in your lives to see you young leaders leading in ministry and leading so effectively and doing it so well, it's, it's incredible. It's humbling. It's, it's a beautiful thing what has happened. And, and for me to be with you today is very exciting. Uh, I'm just uh, your number one cheerleader. Wherever I go, I talk about Highlands. It's kind of like uh, when you go to heaven, you're going to want to come back here for the weekends. <laughs> and I just love, uh, love being with you. you. You have a contagious spirit. In fact, that's what makes you so beautiful. God in you is coming out of you to other people. So look at your neighbor and say, you're, you're contagious in your Christian walk. Tell them that, would you? You're contagious. And may that be something that we develop and grow over the years. Amen? Something that just allows us to, to really expand and, and reach out and, and be who we want to be. This, won't not, this will not be a, a message or a, like a preaching message. This will be a teaching. But the teaching I'm going to give to you, honestly, is uh, the closest teaching I could give to you from my heart. It's, it's who I am. It's what I love. It's what I do. And if somebody would walk into my life and say, if there's only one thing you could do on earth, what would it be? I would very quickly say what it would be very simply is that I would every day share my faith with other people about how Jesus incredibly beautifully can change lives. I love personally sharing my faith. I love seeing people receive Christ in church. I, I love the fact that people come to church and seek a friendly organizations like yours and they, and they find God here. But it's not my highlight. It's not my highlight. The greatest things I've ever seen God do in my personal life is when I am sharing my faith one-on-one -on -one with totally lost people, far from God, far from the church, but so created to know him that when I begin to share my faith, the Holy Spirit begins to work in their life and they begin to want to come home although they've never been home before. And I hope to do a good job with this. I, I, I hope to just very simply, practically help you understand how to do this in such a way that as I know you're getting ready, you're going home for the holidays and, and you're going to be back in family and community, people that you know, people that you love. And it will be my hope that what I teach today will be contagious to you and that you will begin to have a passion more than anything else in life to lead people personally to Christ. It's my passion. 
I love to write books. I love to preach. It's not my highest calling. It's not my greatest joy. My greatest joy is sharing what Jesus can do in the life of a person who does not know him and probably will never know him unless I'm the person that introduces them to him. Here's the thought I want you to have, and then the teaching begins. There are hundreds of people that the only way they'll ever know God is because you personally share your faith. You are between them and heaven. Trust me. You are the key. You're going to be the catalyst. You're going to be the intro to these people knowing God. And once you learn how to share your faith, and once you begin to do it for a few times, it will change everything about you spiritually. And I know that for a fact because my life has been changed. So let's get going. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff on the screen. Feel free to take pictures on the screen uh, as I teach you. And the reason for that is because, thank you, Mark. By the way, that's Mark Cole. Would you give him a hand? Now, Mark is the CEO of our companies. He's part owner of them, and he's just my right-hand person, and he's just incredible. And what really made him incredible today is while I was down front, I had, I'm not technical at all, you have to understand, I had lost the message. And so I said, Mark, I've lost the message. <laughs> and so they gave, me, they gave me the notes that will be on the screen. And so Mark, and while I'm talking to you in the intro, Mark is finding my message. If you know how little I knew about technology, <laughs> you'd come up and lay hands on me. <laughs> I, I figure I'm going to die just about the right time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There's just going to be a day when I just say, I can't figure it out, Lord. Take me home. Take me home. Just, <laughs> just, just, just take me home. But the message and the teaching I'm going to do now is on the heart of Jesus. And we're going to open up with a passage of Scripture in, in his first sermon in Matthew chapter 5. And, and this is the, what I call the, the salt and light message. It's on your notes. And it's on the screen. And Jesus is talking. He says, let me tell you why you are here. So when people say, I would like to know what God's will for my life is. I would like to know what God wants me to do. Well, here it is. Jesus tells you. It's very clear. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and wound up in the garbage. And then he says, now, I don't, I don't want you to miss this. Here's another way to put it. He said, I want you to be salt. But he said, let me give you another example. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors, God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. And do not miss this next phrase. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So I am a um, salt and light person. In fact, on my iPhone, I got me a salt shaker and I got me a light bulb, I, I shake the salt and turn on the light. And I just put under that, be these. This is, this is who Jesus wants us to become. At the end of his ministry, so that's the beginning of his ministry. He said, I want you to be salt and light. I want you to penetrate the, your culture and your community. I want you to make things better. I want you to make things brighter. And at the end of his ministry, these are his last words to his followers. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. I know that experience. I know what it's like to receive the power of the Holy Spirit for witnessing. I remember it well. I was just a little older than you, just in my first year of pastoring. I remember well seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, seeking to be a, a, a witness that could be effective that could make a difference. I, I know what it's like to have God fill me 
and anoint me and cover me and send me as a, as a witness of him and to him. And since it's so important to him that we are doing this, I'm going to share with you how, how, do, we, how do we make this positive difference? How do we become salt and light? How, how, do we, how do we help people know God? And I'm going to give you a, a, probably about a half a dozen things. Let's go. Number one, live a life that is positive and contagious. When I look at the scriptures and I see the Christian's life, it's very obvious to me that we are to be contagious, positive, dynamic people that make people hungry for God. Jesus uses the salt and light analogy, but remember when he was on earth, what he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. In the book of Acts, when I was 24, I read the book of Acts every day from, cover, from one end to the other because I just so wanted to know and be so immersed in, in that culture. I, I just wanted to, what, to, be, to be like the people of the book of Acts and, and the, what they were seeing and what they were able to do. And, and it was amazing. I just would mark up the book of Acts and I came to the conclusion that, that these men and women, they just lived beyond their means. It's what astounded people. Their life was so dynamic or their life was so contagious that the, the church was growing daily. And out of that time in the book of Acts, I, I wrote down something that has stayed with me all of my life, and here it is. I try to live my life in such a way that the people who know me, but they don't know God, get the picture. I try to live my life in such a way that people who know me, but they don't know God, will come to know God because they know me. Now, th that's... That's my aim, to live my life daily in such a way that those who know me but they don't know God will come to know God because they know me. And we're set up for this success, students. We're, we're set up to, to be absolutely successful in sharing our faith because of all that he equips us to be. He, he sets us up to to be examples, to be models, to, to make people hungry. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit, my gosh, the fruit of the Spirit, it's within you, talks about divine love and all the expressions of divine love. I mean, talk to me. Wouldn't you like to meet people that have joy that overflows, that have a peace that subdues, a, a, a patience that endures, a kindness in action, a faith that prevails, a gentleness of heart, a strength of spirit. Now, now, this is what we're to look like. This is when the world sees us, they, they, they need to be saying things like, I've never seen such joy in a person's life. I, I'm watching you during, during a difficult time and you're filled with peace. You're, you, you're so kind. You're so kind in your actions. You see, people do what people see. And the only gospel they're going to see, most people, are, the, only, the only Bible they're going to see, the only Jesus they're going to see, honestly, is, is, is you. It's you. And, and, and we have to all ask ourselves, am I a plus in people's lives or am I minus in people's lives? Am I adding value to them and, and do they light up when they see me? Or, or, or do, when they see me, they're like, oh my gosh, here, here he comes. You see, what I want to be known for is, I don't want to be known for books I write and all the other stuff I've got in my life. In fact, people, when I get introduced, I think they're introducing me with stuff that I don't even want to be known for. I just want to be known for the fact that I love God and I love people. And let me tell you something. The more you love people, the more you love people, the more they'll want to love your God. There is a definite relationship between you loving people unconditionally and them being hungry to know God. So as we're beginning now to, to learn who we're to be as witnesses unto him, it begins with our life. It's to be a positive, contagious life. Number two, intentionally develop relationships with people 
who do not know God. If somebody would walk into my life and say, John, with your time of sharing your faith and quote the success that you've had in it, if you could give one key, what would it be? I would tell you that I am very intentional. I'm very intentional in developing relationships with people who do not know God, people who do not come to church. I, I, I make sure every day I'm doing something that allows me to connect with someone who perhaps will never know God if they have to come to church. They, they may not even know Christians. I, I'm very intentional. And Paul was. He's my model, 1 Corinthians 9. Here we go. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone. In other words, Paul basically says, I can do anything I want to do. I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order. Why, why, is he going to, why is he going to become a servant? In order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralist, loose living, immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. In other words, he, Paul says, I, I just, in fact, when he gets done starting with his list, he says, I don't think my list is complete. I just want you to know I want to reach whoever. Sounds like God, doesn't it? For God so loved the world. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. Now here's the key. But I entered their world. Students, we have to intentionally enter the world of lost people. We, we, we have to be intentional. Because Christians will keep you from it. Under, understand, the hardest part of me being a pastor was trying to get to lost people. Because church people wanted my time. And all my life was scheduled around church and people and Christians. So I entered their world. And why did he enter their world? He said, I tried to experience things from their point of view. And the reason he wanted to experience things from their point of view is Paul understood that you cannot effectively share your faith from a Christian perspective. You only can share your faith from their perspective. You have to know who they are. Now, we obviously have God's word. We obviously have salvation. We, we have so many assets in our life that are Christian. But we can't connect with them with those assets. We have to connect with them where they are and how they live right now. Now, what happens when we enter their world? Two things. Two incredible things. And you'll discover this very quickly, personally, when you do it. The first thing that happens when you enter their world is you get a lot of compassion for lost people. Your, your compassion will compound more than I can ever explain to you today. Look what happened to Jesus. Matthew 9, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among people. But when he saw the multitudes, didn't see them in the synagogue. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In fact, it's out of this passage of Scripture and the Luke passage and others that you get your incredible, the labors are, 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 are few. The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. I, I love the emphasis that you have here at Highlands College. Now, now, I don't want you to miss this. Jesus went to where the people were. And it was only when he went to where the people were and saw them that he had compassion. I tell Christians all the time, you can't get compassion for lost people when you're away from them. It's impossible. it's impossible. I'll tell you what you do. The longer you're away from people that don't know God, the more you become critical of them. I can very quickly tell when people are with lost people most of the time and when they're not. It, it, I can take, give me a two-minute conversation with a Christian, I can tell you if they're salt and light or not. It, it's so quick, it's so obvious for me to read because I can tell you when you enter the world, you'll be moved with compassion. And here's what I found. The closer, don't, don't miss this. This is so true. The closer I get to them, the more I love them. You, you don't love people at a distance. You don't love people that you label. The closer I get to them, the more I love them. And then here's what I found. 
The closer I get to them, not only the more I love them, the closer I get to them, the more I love God. The, the love of God incredibly increases in my life when I enter their world. So per, you, you get compassion. The second thing you get is perspective. When you're close to them, how, you see, how we view things is how we do things. And what my discoveries have been about people that are lost is that most of those people, they just have a wrong picture of God. In fact, the reason they're lost is because they have a wrong picture of God. And, and by the way, most of those people also have a, a wrong picture of Christians. They have a wrong picture of the church. And, and most people, most people want to know God, but they just don't know that they want to know God. They, they don't know what that emptiness is because no one's ever explained it to them. That they were created to know God, but now they need somebody to be an awakener and give them awareness. That, that they feel it on the inside. They're, again, they're like my atheist friend one day, and I was talking to him, and I said, I know you don't believe in God, but you sure do miss him, don't you? Well, of course he misses him. Can I tell you something? Every person that doesn't have a relationship with God, they miss him. They don't know how to define it, but they miss him. They miss him because they were created to know him. And until they know him, there's an emptiness, there's a void, there's a lostness, there's a disconnect. And my name's John, and I'm their friend. And I walk into their life, and I help them be aware. I can remember when I was pastoring in San Diego, and I was so intrigued by how the Mormons prepared missionaries that that I asked the, the Mormon mission school if I could come for a, a, a week and just immerse myself in the school. And of course, I told them who I was, and, and I, cause I, I, but I, I just wanted to see how they trained because they seemed to be so effective in their training. And much to my surprise, they said, yes, you can. You can, you can come. And, and so I went to uh, the Mormon missionary school, and I was enrolled for a week, and I went to the classes and did everything. And, and, but the one thing, they only requested one thing. They said, could we have lunch with you every day? I said, of course. And every day they would have another professor, teacher at the school, have lunch with me. And every conversation was always the same. They'd ask me to show pictures of their family. I'd show pictures of the family. They'd begin to talk about how important family was. And they would begin to tie their Mormon teaching into my family. And, 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 and they, what they were doing, it was so beautiful to watch them do it. They, they were going after what I call my spiritual spot. Everybody has a spiritual spot. Everybody has one. Everybody, everybody has a place where you go in and enter into their life. And let me tell you something. You don't know what their spiritual spot is unless you spend time with them. The, the Bible says, and this is so beautiful, that the person who wins souls is wise. The Bible doesn't say you're wise if you win souls. It doesn't say that. It says the person who wins souls is wise. You see, the wisdom that I have after leading thousands of people personally to Christ. The wisdom that I have is I can find their spiritual spot very quickly. In fact, if you were with me, you'd just say, John, it's amazing how very quickly you settle in and, and they connect. And, and of course, it's very easy. And, and then you would say, well, you, John, you must be, have an amazing gift of evangelism and you must be brilliant. And I would tell you, I'm not brilliant. I'm not brilliant. My name's, I'm not brilliant. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even find my sermon this morning. <laughs> That's how stupid I am. There's nothing, there's nothing brilliant about me. But when it comes to sharing my faith, you've never seen anything like me. I, I mean, you really haven't. I could smell it, see it, feel it, think it. it it's that power of proximity. It, it's, can I tell you something? I teach you're never good the first time, and you aren't. And the first time I shared my faith, I didn't know the answers, and I just said, can I come back and I'll give you the answers. And I did that hundreds of times, by the way. You're never good the first time, but if you do it about 20,000 times, you really get good. And I'm good. And I earned it. I worked for it. You, you see, if you don't do it, you won't be very good. One of the things I love about what you do, Chris, with the, with the kids here at the chapel is they're up here, they're, they're leading the chapel. They're doing everything. I love that. I, I love watching you lead. I mean, my gosh, I saw Nathan do that little preach, a little sermonette. And, 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 yeah. I mean, hey, and that was not a sermonette for Christianettes. I mean, that was a sermon. That was, I mean, that was like a full scale, come on, I'm coming to you. I mean, I, 
I, I went over and gave him a big hug. And then so I, so I had the Maxwell Leadership Bible, and I said, oh, bless you, my child. And <laughs> I, I, I signed it. And then I looked at him and said, I wish when I was your age I could preach that well. Because I couldn't. I wasn't even, I wasn't even close to him. Why, 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 are, why are you getting good in ministry here? Because you practice ministry here. You, practice, you see, you, I mean, 800 hours of, uh, before you graduate, uh, practical training with the church. C can I tell you something? You're, you're gonna, you, when you go to the churches, you're already equipped. You're already equipped because you learned in a culture, in an environment that is highly successful in equipping people. It's, it's, when you walk out, it's not what you know. It's who you are. Who you are. And it's the same thing with sharing your faith. When you begin to intentionally share your faith. And by the way, when I started, I committed 10 hours a week of time being with lost people. And I've never violated that. Even though I was a pastor, I just had to get away from Christians. Just had to. In fact, the, the dilemma I'm going to have when I go to heaven is they're all Christians. I thought, oh my gosh, that could get me kind of boring. I, I want you to become intentional. Because once you're with them, it'll give you compassion and it will give you, it will give you a perspective. Wow. And, and I always find common ground with lost people. It's so easy to find common ground. You find common ground with lost people, not trying to prove they're wrong or not trying to argue with them or not looking for objection. It's very simple. You just find something that you both have in, con in common. I have a very, very highly successful Sikh Hindu couple that are major in New York City in business and they're part of our coaching team and, and I've had an influence and spoken to their company and, and their Sikhs and, and we've had now three conversations about what we have in common. And the other day he came to me and he said, I'm ready, she's almost ready. Of course they're ready, of course. Number three, to be this salt and light, we have to value people, and we have to consistently add value to them. We, we value them, which is the basis of us adding value to them. You see, valuing everybody helps me connect with everybody, and adding value to them increases my influence. And after 25 years of pastoring, when my publisher told my books were being bought by the secular community, and I felt immediately that I needed to cross over and spend the rest of my life in a lost world. My first question was, how do I reach them for Christ? How, 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 do, I, how do I do that? And it was very clear to me as I began to ask God to give me wisdom that was way beyond me, it was very clear to me that my responsibility was to add value to them first. That, that my first responsibility wasn't to share my faith, but my first responsibility was to, add, to value them and add value to them. And, and this was life-changing for me because it, what it does is it made me earn my relationship with them. It made me have integrity with my relationship with them. In fact, I was... Last year, I was with the public school uh, leaders of, of every state in, in America, all 50 states, and I was at a retreat in New Mexico, and I was talking about valuing people, and we were in a Q&A, and one of the leaders raised her hand and said, John, she said, it, it bothers me that you say that you value me, and you don't know me. I said, well, that's fair. I said, I, I, I think that bothered me too. By the way, Christians, quit arguing. Dear God, you're wearing me out. <laughs> you don't win people by telling them they're wrong. You don't win people by arguing. And I said, well, that would bother me too. And as soon as it, I said it would bother me too, I mean, she's, I, I, I don't mean this unkindly. I own her now. Oh, well, that would bother me too. I, I understand that. And I said, I do have an answer for you, but I'm not sure I could give it and should give it. Because it's, it's an answer. The answer I have is a legitimate answer, but it's out of my faith. And I wouldn't I would want to impose that on you. Maybe you don't want to hear about my faith. It's okay. But, it, but, but I can't give you the answer unless you just let me be open and authentic with you about my faith. And she said, oh, no. She said, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. 
Of course he wants to hear it. Just let people know that you don't have to share and they want you to share. <laughs> he that winneth souls is wise. Can I tell you something? I can do this all day long. I, I can do this all day long. I know how to lead people to Christ. Not because I'm smart, but because I practice every day. And so I told her, I said, well, I said, uh, you, so I said, you don't mind me coming out of a faith perspective. She said, no, I, I, because I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, how could you value me when you don't know me? I said, well, it's very simple. I am a person of faith and I value you because God values you. See, he created you. He not only created you, he created you in his own image. He gave you gifts that would help you to be successful in life. He put within you a desire to know him. I value you because God values you. And these public school leaders, a hundred of them on all 50 states, they just broke out in applause. And, and when it was all over, she came up and she said, thanks for that answer. And she said, I would have never understood that answer because I'm not a person of faith, but now I do. Well, what am I doing? I'm starting to open the eyes. You see, the eyes of lost people are closed. They're closed. So another thing that you want to do and be in salt and light, number four, is you want to sow spiritual seeds every day and in every way. And, and don't miss it. You just want to always sow spiritual seeds every day in every way. I can tell you without any question in my mind, for 40 years, I've never missed a day in my life of sowing spirituals. I, 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 it, it, is, it is so much of who I am. In the morning when I wake and I say, God, you know who I'll come into contact with? Start talking to me. Start talking to the other person. Help me to connect with somebody that's lost. Here's what I want you to know. God will match your passion to reach people with creativity of how to do it. But listen to me carefully. If you don't have passion to reach people, you'll get Zippo creativity. You see, it's the passion. It's my heart. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. God knows who he can give creativity to. God knows. He knows that I'm looking. He knows that I want to sow spiritual seeds. And I'm constantly sowing spiritual seeds. And, and I'm going to talk to you about them now. But let me tell you, the, the number one seed that I constantly live, love, and serve, and sow is what I call the belief seed. And the belief seed is very simple. I believe everyone wants to know God. I believe everyone. When I say that, that bothers Christians so badly. I can see and feel the resistance half the times. I don't feel it here. My gosh, you're beautiful. Dear Lord, I... I just want to scatter you throughout the world is what I want to do. and Say, you know, come on, just rain on them a little bit. Give them some salt and light. Give them some sugar, too. Christians need, <laughs> Christians need sugar. I tell you, I, some Christians, I'm not even asking them to be saved. I just like them to be nice. <laughs> wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be nice if Christians just be nice? Just, just, you know, I, I, I just live for the day of Christians to be nice. Nice people. Nice, kind, considerate. Ooh, that would be so sweet kind of be like Jesus. But the strongest seed I have is the belief seed. And I believe, I believe you say, John, honestly, come on, you're, that seems a little hypey to me. Do you mean you really believe everybody wants to be? Yes, I, I, believe, I believe everybody. See, I believe everybody doesn't know how to be saved. I, I believe people don't understand what's happening within them. They have to have somebody like myself or you to walk into the life. But, but I believe everybody wants to be saved. And the reason I believe everybody wants to know God is because once they understand that with God comes grace, forgiveness, unconditional love, abundant life, I mean, how, how, much, how long of a list do you want? It's all attractive. It's all attractive. And because I believe everyone wants to know God, I try to reach everyone for God. You see, if you don't believe that, you won't try it. Your belief sets limitations on you. And so now, because I believe everyone wants to know God, I sow spiritual seeds all the time. I, 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 I sow curiosity seeds every day. I use the networking question, who do you know that I should know? And we go around the room sometimes, and when it comes to me, I said, well, really, honestly, if you're asking me really who I know, what I'd really like you to know is, 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 to, is to know God. And I, and I, just, I, I just form questions that 
cause people in conversation to come my way and, and give me the chance to introduce God to them. I, I sow what I call secret seeds. This is, you know, this is kind of like Christmas. I, I know something you don't know. Oh, this one's powerful. I do this all the time. I'll be teaching in, in a secular setting, and I'll say, now let me tell you, there are four ways to add value to people, and I'd like to give you three. <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> in fact, honest to God, when I'm with secular people, sometimes I want to say, I, I just want you to know up, up front, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> because you're going to hopelessly come to God when it's all over. But, but there are four ways to add value to people, and let me give you three. Well, as soon as I say let me give you three, everybody's thinking, why don't I get four? And so they'll press me. I'll give them three, and somebody says, but didn't, didn't you say four? Yeah, I said four, but you only gave us three. Yeah, I only gave you three. Why did you only give us three? I said, well, because I want to be fair to you and, and treat you with respect. And the fourth one is, is about my faith, and I would never put that on you. I, I don't want to put that on you. That's, I mean, this isn't what I'm here for. I'm here to help at that. So I, it, it's okay. Three's good. Three, you know, three's good. Three, three's good. Can I tell you, you tell people three's good when they know there's four? They don't think it's good at all. <laughs> they don't think it's good at all. Not, not, not at all. I, I just did a teaching in Charleston a couple of weeks ago, and it, it was a teaching with a bunch of very successful real estate people. And I did a thing called, you know, I did a thing called, if I could spend a day with you. And, and what I told him was, if I could spend a day with you, here's what I would, here's what I would do and, and, and share. And, and, and so, I, so I, I looked at them and, and, and I said, let me share with you. I don't have time for a day. It's only a half a day. So let, let, okay. let me give you three. Now, I think I could give you four. But the fifth one I, I won't give you today. And the reason I won't give it to you today it's, it's about my faith. So let's just do the four. So we went ahead and, 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 and we did the four. I'm just trying to pick something up on my iPhone here. I am so worthless. <laughs> Thank you. I feel better already. <laughs> you, you entered my world. You, you entered my world. Mark, could you pull up my salvation thing on here for me? Here, just, just, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's just a. What is it again? What is it It's just under salvation. But, but see, when I hit this, this comes up. And that's the people we've led the Lord. And I just pull, what frustrates me, that, I just, I just list, pulled it list, up in the green room. That list has Chris Hodges on it. Oh, oh that list had, he said that list had Chris Hodges on it. Okay. Now, listen very carefully. So I was in Charleston, and so I finished, I finished the, uh, the, the lesson, and, and somebody raised their hand. They said, John, really, you didn't give us the lesson? I said, I know I didn't. And, and I said, I didn't because it, it's about my faith in God. But I said, let me just say this. Everything you see of me in, in the success of my life, now that ticks me off. Next time, could you act like it's hard? I mean, could you stall a little bit and kind of scratch your head? I mean, you just come, yeah, this is it. So when I'm done, I looked at him and I said, look, if you would like to know about my faith, just give me one of your business cards and put God on it. And just hand it to me. When it's all done, just bring it to me and I'll call you and I'll share my faith with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen people. Fifteen people. They not only come and find me, but they put God on it. And just the other day before I went to the Middle East, I called Cassie. And as soon as I she picked up the phone, she said, John, she said, uh, 
Is, is this the God call? Yeah, this is the God call. Let me tell you something. People out there are so hungry for God. We do not have, we do not have a harvest problem. We've got a labor problem. We do not have a lack of receptivity. We don't have a bunch of people that are giving the finger to God. We got a whole bunch of people. They don't even know they know God. But they know they need something. And they're not going to know that they need him until we come into their life and make them aware. And what I'll do is when I get back home, what I do every Christmas is 10 days before Christmas, I line up 10 people and every day I, I share my faith. And that's kind of like my Merry Christmas to Jesus on, 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 on Christmas. I, I sow success seeds. I sow success seeds all the time. In fact, I'll, I'll, be, doing a, a, I'll be doing a Zoom call on, 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 on financial wisdom to a bunch of secular people on Monday. And, and my lesson for them is going to be, if you want to be truly successful in business and, and, and in life, read, uh, you know, there are 31 Proverbs. Read one proverb every day. I got lost people. I got lost people reading Proverbs all the time. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're reading them more than Christians. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They really, it, 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 just, it's just huge. This is just huge. Now, let me, let, you're doing so good. Number five, always be prepared to share your faith. Always be prepared to share your faith. Like my, my mentor, John Wooden, said, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. Yeah. You're going to have opportunities to share your faith, and you're going to say, what do I do? First Peter, you know what he said. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you. I love that. For the reason for the hope that is in you. In other words, Christians, you ought to have so much hope that people are coming to you and saying, what's so beautifully different about you? Yeah. This is, when Christians live to the standard that God wants them to live, they will become contagious soul winners. And so I, I, I'm always, I have what I call them, call them make them hungry statements. I just go around and make people hungry. And so when somebody says, you know, boy, I, you know, I, I just, I just have a, I, I'm just, I have a problem in my life. I, I look at them and say, I, I know problems are just problems, aren't they? Good Lord. I, I just, I just wish you had my faith. Well, why is that? Because, well, if you had my faith, you, you would have God to help you with your problems. Well, I, you know, I'm under, I got a lot of stress and anxiety. I know, boy, I wish you had my faith. If I say I wish you had my faith once a week, I say it 20 times a week. I wish you had my faith. I wish you had my faith. Oh, my gosh. I wish you had faith. I, oh, you're, I know. I know. You're troubled. I, why? I wish you had my peace. Good Lord. I wish you had this. Oh, I like you so much. I hate for you to live in deficit. I hate you. Why? You don't need to live beneath your privileges. I just, I just wish. I just wish. I wish you had my faith. You, you have no idea how people lean into love. Now, listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. They lean into love. Do, do not miss this. Lost people can tell whether you love them or not. So don't try to fake it till you make it. They can tell very quickly. And most lost people don't think Christians love them at all. You just, you, if you had any understanding of how lost people think of the church, you'd be so disappointed because the church does, and the Christians, we live way beneath, we live way, 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 way beneath our privileges. But when you love people and you look at them and say, I, I just wish, I wish you had my faith, they will lean into you. Lean, love makes people lean. Don't miss this. Love makes people lean. People want to lean into people who love them. And so what I share when I share my faith is what I call the four pictures of God. And I'm going to give it to you now. And it's just very simple. Um, I do it without a Bible. I don't usually have a Bible with me. Uh, there was a time when I always shared my faith with the Bible, but the Bible is not very relevant to people anymore. At one time, even lost people wanted to see what the Bible said. You know, I, my world now, I mean, I was at a secular convention the other day, and somehow they got books messed up, and they literally put one of my Maxwell Leadership Bibles on a, 
on the, on the business table, and this guy got it, and he brought it up to me, and he says, this got your name on it. I said, well, yeah, I said, I said it's the Maxwell Leadership Bible. This is amazing. He said, did you write the Bible? <laughs> I was so tempted. <laughs> That's that hippopotamus in me. That's that hippo. I, I got a lot of hippo in me. I, I, got a lot of, I got a lot of hippo humor that can get me in trouble. I was so tempted to say, well, there were only four books of John in there. I didn't write the whole Bible. I, <laughs> Of course, I told him, no, I didn't write the Bible. Of course, I didn't write the Bible. And he said, well, I, he, he, he said, but it's got your name. I said, well, I have leadership lessons in here. He said, you mean you're teaching leadership out of I said, yes, I teach leadership out of the Bible. He said, you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. He said, well, I, I don't have a Bible. I've never read the Bible. He said, but I, th I think I'm going to buy this one. He, you, you say there's leadership lessons? I said, yes. And I said, what I would encourage you to do is just read the leadership lessons. Don't worry about the Bible. Now you say, John, why would you say that? Because the Holy Spirit, once he gets in there, won't let him go. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is an incredible asset. And when we start sowing seeds, long story short, literally that happened. And I saw him a few years later. And he came up to me and he said, do you remember me? It always cracks me up when people ask me if I remember them. I've I did Promise Keepers for years with 70,000 in a stadium, and people come say, I was at Promise Keepers in Indianapolis. Do you remember me? Oh, yeah, I, I remember you well out of 70,000 people. <laughs> but he came up to me and said, do you remember me? And, and I, I said, yeah, I, I do remember you. He said, I'm the guy that bought the, yeah, I said, I remember you. And then he just started weeping. He said, six months after reading your leadership lesson. He said, I started reading your leadership lesson, and I thought, these don't make any sense until I find what, what this says. The person that wins souls is wise. L listen to me. I'm going to tell you. There's a lot of things I'm not. But I'm very wise in soul winning. I'm brilliant in soul winning. Because I do it all the time. The wisdom comes with practice. And the four pictures are very simple. I got them from the lost world, by the way. When, when, I, when I would talk to lost people, and, they didn't, they, and if God came up, and I'd say, well, what do you think about God, or you know, do you know God, or whatever, and, and I would listen to them talk about it, and I would ask questions, and pretty soon I saw that there were three common barriers to knowing God. One was a fence, there, 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 a, a, a big wall, maybe that's even a better way to say it, that there were people who believed in God, but they believed he was on one side, they were on the other side, and they never could have access to him. It's kind of like... Wow, he's there. I know he's there, but I'm never going to get to see him. So it's not that they don't believe in God. They just don't think it's for them. And so when I talked to them about the wall, the fence, I, I explained to them that God wants a relationship with them more than they want it with him. And then I talk about how God jumped the fence. Oh, yeah, he's a high jumper. Did you know that? He jumped the fence and sent his son into this world. He didn't wait for us to come to him. He comes to us. The second picture is a garbage can. This is a little gross. You see, the fence says, you know, God's not reachable. It's, he's not relatable. But when I talk about the garbage can, they, they think about all the junk and sin in their life. And how many people have said, well, you know, my gosh, God wouldn't want me. He, woo, I would mess everybody up. I, you know, no, no. And, and, I, 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 and, and, and you know, no, no, a garbage can, a garbage dump, there's nothing attractive about that. I mean, nobody ever says, let's go by the garbage dump and take pictures today. And I talk to them, and then I tell them that how God is attracted to the garbage in your life. And how he is a doctor, and he comes for sick people. And how as a shepherd, he looks for lost people. And how he's just absolutely 
hungry to, to know you. And, and the more sin you have, the more he wants to even know you. And, and then I tell him that no matter how much sin you have, you, you, you may be a big sinner, but he's a bigger savior. You, you, you don't, so don't get in this race. I'm going to outdo him. No, no, no. You can go as low as you want to go. When you get as low as you want to go, he's there. And then I talk to him about a ladder or a stairway, how people, sometimes they want to work their way for their salvation. And I'm going to start, climb, I'll do good things, and, you know, the, the, the good work stuff. We know about this. And, and, and I talk to him about that. that, that it, that's, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, admirable thing to want to do good things, but that has nothing to do with, you know, your salvation. In fact, uh, it, you know, do is, is a word for religion. We do things, but, but Jesus has already done it. He's already done it. And then I talk about the door, how Christ knocks at the door. Beautiful. I, I tell them if, if you're 10,000 steps from Jesus, he'll take 9,999 and come right to your heart's door. And he'll just gently knock. He, 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 he just, he's just there. He's just waiting for you. Now, I'm done. In fact, I've, I've, I've gone a, a little bit over time. I'm done. I, I want to say two things to you. I want to say, first of all, what a privilege it is for me to, to share with you how I share my faith. And what a joy it is to, to me to literally watch you, heads down, taking notes, hungry, not m wanting to miss one thing on this very important subject. And so I, I just feel very honored by you because you're so receptive. You, you're so receptive to learning and growing and, and doing better, becoming more. But I also want to say to you, that this is the, probably the most important thing that I'll do during these Christmas holidays, talking to you about sharing your faith, because you can do something about this. See, see, you're eager to take notes, but that eagerness is beyond note-taking. There's an eagerness in you to be a fisher of men, to follow him and become a fisher of men and women. And it's that eagerness that encourages me because you're going to go home and many of you maybe have parents that don't know God. You, you perhaps have siblings, friends, school friends, community friends. And, and I want you to start practicing sharing your faith. And, and I want you to know that the first time you do it, you'll have a lot of questions. Don't worry. Do it anyway. And, and don't worry, you won't be that good. But you don't have to be that good because God will make up the difference. And you just start, just start practicing and learning and taking. Be as eager to learn as you practice as you are as I teach you. Because what I believe is that for some of you, you're going to become a soul winner. You're going to become a young man or a young woman that has a heart for lost people. And then you're going to experience the joy. Listen to me. You may be a music worship leader. You may be a pastor. You may be a youth man. I, I don't know what ministry you're going to be in. But whatever it is, if you know how to share your faith, there will be an added dimension of effectiveness in your ministry that is untouchable by anyone else. You, you have to know this to be true. God will give you favor and anointing the moment he knows that he can trust you with sharing your faith. So could I have the privilege of just praying over you? And, and, and I, 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 this is a simple prayer. We're going to have a commission prayer that's going to be important in a moment. I'm going to get out of your way, but, but th listen to me very carefully. I, I, would, I would love to just pray over you. And, and, and I'm not wanting, we don't need to do Simon Says here. We don't need everybody, we don't need to do all that. But look at me. If what I've said to you resonates, if what I said to you speaks to your heart, if what I said to you today, you're saying, this is an area I need to raise my level. If, if that is happening to you, just stand where you are, and I'm going to pray over you right now. I'm just going to ask God to do his work.
I wish I could lay hands on each one of you, but I'll reach out to you. Father, thank you for these students. I just love their heart for you. They're, I, I love how they're in a culture, a, a, a Christ-like leadership, let's make a difference culture. And, and they're already standing out because they're part of this environment. I pray over them. They're going to go home. And, and they're going to, every one of these, in this, every person in this room is going to have an opportunity to share their faith in the next few days. Everyone. There, there will not be one of us that will not have an opportunity to share our faith. So may we look, take the notes and make that our prayer time. And we may pray over them. And may we, may we be as ready as we could be. And when the opportunity comes, just give us that love for people and that courage to begin to share the four pictures of God. And I just pray, Father, that when they do that, you will do what you have done for me thousands and thousands of times. I just start. And then you, Holy Spirit, you come in and speak to that heart. And I watch you, God, I watch you all the time begin to do a work that, that you just needed me to open up the door so that you could begin to do the work. And, and then you begin to speak to their hearts and they begin to be hungry to know you. And I'm just going to ask, Father, that you would give a special anointing, a favoring, a covering upon these students. May you give them a, a heart that just says, the most important thing I can ever do in my life is lead somebody to Jesus. Because, Lord, everything else, everything, everything, everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. There's only one thing that counts, and that is getting people ready to know you. And I just ask that you would now fill this room and fill every heart with a passionate desire to just um, be that young man, be that young woman who doesn't wait for somebody to come to church or doesn't wait for the worship team to sing or doesn't wait for a message or doesn't wait for an invitation, but they say right now is the appointed time of their salvation. And may they have the joy in the spring break of just seeing somebody come to Christ. And all glory and all praise and all honor will be given unto you because you're the only one worthy of honor, praise, and glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, and the students say, Amen. Amen.